Welcome to the Teachers on Fire podcast, where I profile agents of growth and transformation in education today. Each guest shares their highs, their lows, their passions, their goals, and the resources that are shaping their thinking and inspiring their practice. For show notes and links from each episode, visit teachersonfire.net. You can also follow the show at Teachers on Fire on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And of course, please subscribe to the show wherever you are listening right now. I'm your host, Tim Cavey. Let's meet today's guest. Today, I'm speaking with Dr. Francois Nodia. Francois is an award-winning teacher, education engineer, co-founder of the Work Integrated Learning Tracker, speaker, presenter, author, podcaster, consultant, mentor, entrepreneur, and CrossFit fan. (laughs) Follow Francois on Twitter at super underscore teacher underscore F, on Instagram at the same handle, and on his podcast at Super Teachers Unite. And of course, his YouTube channel as well at youtube.com slash super teachers unite. Glad to see you got that customized URL on the YouTube channel. Dr. Francois, reading that incredible bio reminds me just how much you inspire me. I am so grateful for our friendship and so appreciate you coming on the show today. Are you ready to talk education? Tim, I am on fire and I'm ready to go. (laughs) <laughs> That's the answer I'm looking for. Francois, why don't you start by telling us a little bit more about your current context in education? What does that look like for you? Tim, I'm currently an education consultant. I started my own uh, education consultancy about six or seven months ago with the, with the motivation and the purpose to motivate, inspire, and support teachers. Um, I come I come from a background of teaching I taught in public and in private sector here in South Africa for eight years. Um, I won the National Teachers Award in our country. And then I was asked to come and train teachers at the University of Johannesburg. And um, whilst uh, training other teachers in a university setting, I just realized that I'm not fulfilling my purpose. I'm being taken away from working with in-service teachers. And that's really where my passion lies. So currently I'm uh, working with individual teachers. I'm working with schools um, as well as with universities to see how we can um, train teachers and how we can coach teachers to be super teachers. You mentioned the timeline. You started this consultancy six or seven months ago, I believe you said, and then you walked right into this global pandemic crisis. So before we go any further, Francois, how are you doing through all of this? And what does the quarantine look like in your world? And of course, also importantly, how has it affected your work? So um, on a a personal level, I'm uh, quite uh, uh, fortunate to be quarantining with uh, my family. So I've got my brother. The two of us are are living together in a flat, but it's on the same premises that my parents are staying. So the four of us are are quite uh, a close-knit family, um, and we're luckily spending the time together. So in the last what's it, eight, eight or nine weeks already that we've been um, first self-isolating and then we, our country went into a national lockdown um, in stage five, which was a total lockdown. And we're now easing a little bit out of it. We're currently in stage four, which basically means exactly the same as stage five, but you're allowed to go and exercise in the morning a little bit. Um, so I'm, I'm quite fortunate to be with my family. But um, as you rightly said, I mean, this is a major impact globally on, on all companies. But I mean, I think the, the, the small to medium businesses are feeling it quite hard. And um, I think on the first day that uh, our president announced uh, that school closures about a week or two before we went into national lockdown. Um, and the following day, I had nine of my events canceled. Um, so you can think that that's quite a, a major impact on on somebody who just started their their consultancy. But I must say, it's um, for the for an entrepreneur. I mean that that feeds right into your 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 area of of interest. If if entrepreneurship was easy, everybody would be doing it. So um, I, I I took I took that knock and I was like, you know what? How can we innovate now? What is the 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 need, where's the necessity? And what I saw happening um, is a lot of teachers not embracing online teaching whatsoever, or at least integrating technology in their teaching. Um, And I think that's the direction that my consultancy and uh, my coaching went in, is supporting teachers now during um, online teaching and and, and how we can can innovatively um, teach uh, in online or in a remote modality. 
innovation and further iterations are really a part of our work. That's part of what we do and who we are as educators. So I love your positive spin. I mean, that would be a devastating blow to lose nine engagements in one day. And yet uh, I've heard nothing but positive energy coming from you, Francois, over the last few weeks. So incredible stuff. I want to get into story time. And if you've heard a few episodes, which I know you have, you, you're familiar with this segment. Would you share with us about a low moment or an experience of adversity that you've faced in your teaching or education career other than the last two months and describe how you overcame it? Tim, I'm a major fan of this of this podcast, and I think this segment is is really valuable because we always tend to focus on uh, when we interview guests on on the amazing things that happen in their life. But there's a lot we can learn from from the adversity that people go through. So I really want to commend you on this specific segment of your podcast. Um, and I, I, from the first time I heard your your podcast and I heard this question, I was like, well, if I was ever to be so fortunate to be on Teachers on Fire, how would I answer this question? And there's this. There's one instance that really pops up. Um, I was quite a, a, a novice teacher. I think it was in the third year or the fourth year of, of my teaching career. Um, I, I never wanted to be a teacher. It was like one of the last things that I ever wanted to, to be, a last job that I wanted to do. And um, when, I, when I stepped into the classroom, I immediately, I mean, after the first week of teaching grade nines, I absolutely just fell in love with this profession and I realized this is where I want to be. But I, I just decided I want to do things differently. I don't want to be the typical teacher. I don't want to want to be that boring teacher. But that, of course, on the other hand, brought with it some challenges that I never foresaw. Um, I, I spend most of my time building relationships with learners um, to, to the... I almost want to say to the dismay of uh, many of my colleagues, they thought I was just too friendly with with kids. Um, and I, I, I never saw it like that. I always wanted to build relationships. I wanted to get their, their interests. So I was spending a lot of my break time um, with the learners, getting to know them. Um, and in some cases, I think I never really understood where the boundary lies. Um, and I think that's very important for, for a novice teacher to, to really um, reflect on this and realize where the, the boundaries are. But basically what happened is I had a grade 11 life orientation class one year. And we've got um, this tradition in South Africa. And I don't know where, whether it's uh, the same in, in Canada. But our last year, the grade 12s, they have this tradition that they call 40 days, which basically is a celebration um, when they've got 40 days of formal schooling left. And then what they tend to do is they pull pranks on teachers and they really be they're, they're, um, mischievous. Um, and it's like every single year try to best the previous year. And you can just think this is a, a recipe for disaster. And in this, in this one uh, group that I taught, in their grade 11 year, they came into my class because the grade 12s of that year um, did some, I can't even remember what they did, but they they made a comment and they said, well, these grade 12s are so lame. Next year when we're in grade 12, we want to do something epic. Um, I'm like, guys, that's all good and well. Just remember that it's, it's, that you, it's all in, in a great spirit. Um, and Forgot about this conversation. A, a whole year later, I was busy teaching grade eights or something, and open my, my door opens, and about thirty grade twelves burst into my classroom, and all of them wearing masks. So I don't even know who is there. I just see them in their school blazers. But about thirty of them come in, and they kidnap me, um, and I am in total shock because I'm not I'm not sure what the hell is happening. So these guys, they. They kidnap me. They carry me through the school building on their shoulders, um, shouting stuff. But then, then it really took a, a turn for the worst. I think they they didn't know where where the the fun started and where it stopped because it really started becoming malicious to such an extent that my life was in danger at a point. Um, I, I won't go into a lot of detail, but these these kids felt comfortable enough to pull a prank on me, um, and and basically not understanding where to draw the line and put my life in danger. And I was livid. And when I eventually, um, later that day, got the, a bunch of them together, because, of course, um, if you want to keep a secret, um, you can't be having 30 people in your party. So somebody leaked the information, and I could figure out who, who the people were that were involved. Um, and 
I asked them, guys, why me? Why did why did you choose me? And they said, sir, you told us we should do it. And I'm like, what are you guys talking about? There's no way that I would give you permission to do this. And so, no, no, no. Remember last year in that life orientation class, we said we want to do something outrageous and then they reminded me of my own words because i said this and as they said that i realized i actually said this that i told them if you want to do something just make sure it's epic it can't be lame it can't be something stupid it has to be epic and this came back to bite me in the butt but then I, I immediately remembered the second phrase, and I think this is what the kids forgot. I, I told them also, just remember that whatever you plan to do in life, that there are repercussions and that you have to live by the repercussions. And they seem to forget that uh, 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 part of what I, what I had to say. So I think that was quite a, a low moment for me because I came in with these good intentions. I wanted to make a difference. I really wanted to build a relationship with the kids. But I didn't communicate it effectively, and I didn't even think about the, the the repercussions of the words that I had to say in class. Incredible story, Francois. I'm laughing, but I completely understand that. On the other hand, it it as you said, it got quite serious, and and the kids took it to a place that it shouldn't have gone. I appreciate your takeaways as well, and I hope for those young people that it did become a, a life lesson that they. Got that. I think you said the course was life orientation, right? So <laughs> yeah. well, hopefully hopefully a year later, they learn something that uh, from that prank gone way too far. No, that, uh, that 40 days ritual or tradition is something that I shudder at. I hope that never comes to North America because that sounds terrifying. But thank you for sharing that. That is incredible. That's amazing. Francois, I'd like to go next to your super teacher. You've built this brand and now your podcast, Super Teachers Unite, around this term. So let's ask the all-important question. In your opinion, what defines a super teacher? So that's that's um, a very, very important question to ask. And I think every single teacher needs to ask that question. What, what makes a competent teacher? What makes a teacher great? Um, and just to give you some background on where the concept of the super teacher comes from, um, after I won the National Teachers Award, I was asked by a university to come and do a motivational talk to a group of uh, first-year students, teacher students. And I was like, what can I contribute? How am I going to, to, to motivate these kids? And I did exactly the same thing that many average teachers would do. I started making up a PowerPoint. And I had a PowerPoint presentation with like the top 10 things you can expect from being a teacher and what are good teachers. And I just realized in my preparation of, of that uh, motivational talk that I'm even bored listening to myself. So how would a, a group of 18 or 19 year old students feel if I were to stand in front of them talking at them about teaching? And at the time, uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe just was on the up um, and there were a lot of these superhero movies. And I decided to to um, to construct or frame my talk around this concept that every teacher is a superhero. We all have our own unique superpowers that we bring to the classroom. Um, in many cases, we're trying to, um, what's the word? We're trying to... Um, imitate the teachers that we knew in our past. Um, and that perpetuates some uh, positive, but as well negative habits in the classroom. But my question is, every single person is unique. We need the, the, the self-awareness to understand what is our strengths. So this analogy of being a super teacher with superheroes is exactly this thing that, um, you know, I introduce myself every single time at the start of my podcast, my shows, or when I do public talks, I stand up and I say, my name is Francois Nordea, and I am a super teacher. And I understand how arrogant that sounds. And I can lose a lot of people in the first instance when I say this, but I have to clarify. It's not that if, if I don't um, call myself a super teacher, Nobody else is going to do it. So we, we have to take that responsibility in uplifting our profession and saying that I am the best possible version of who I can be. So the super teacher thing comes from um, identifying your own strengths. So I can't for one moment try and be pretentious here on your podcast and say this is what a super teacher is and this isn't what a super teacher is because I don't understand your context. You know your context best. You know your abilities and your strengths the best. 
So a super teacher is, in my inst- uh, in my case, I think, somebody that's got the self-awareness of knowing what their capabilities are and know how to use the strength in col- collaboration with their colleagues, because that's the other point. Superheroes don't often um, function on their on their own. They're part of a team. And that's why I love the Avengers movie so so um, so much. Is that we realize that we're so much better as a team. So having a, a group or a league of super teachers in a school, just I mean, just imagine what we can achieve. Such a great question, and I, I heard you on your own podcast ask guests the question: What is your superpower? That's something if I think if you're listening right now, it's a great question to think about what are the unique powers that you bring to the table in a unique way that perhaps a very few other people do. And I think that's a great thought that we are all super teachers. We're all um, we all have those unique sets of abilities and skills that we bring into the classroom. And it's a confidence booster. It's not uh, it's not an arrogant statement, as you put it. You and I have also shared some great conversations, Francois, around this idea of content creation in the education space, something near and dear to both of our hearts. We've shared ideas about podcasts, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. In your view, is content creation and networking a good move for every educator? So I, I I agree with you. I love content creation. I think it's an amazing tool, but I don't think it's necessarily the best thing for all teachers or for everybody in education. It comes back to the self awareness thing. If uh, let let's see, if you if you create content for social media, um, it's basically just a way for you to communicate your skills, and I think that's important. It's important for you to to be able to communicate um, the things that you are good at or the things that you are busy doing. But if um, if you are, a, a, I almost wanted to say a complacent teacher, which I don't hope anybody is, but if you're comfortable with where you are and you're not looking to um, a, a mass of following of other teachers or make a difference in that way, or you're not looking to um, find a new job in education, then probably content creation is not for you. But I would say for 99% of teachers and for principals and schools and universities, it's a no-brainer that we should be communicating on all of the different platforms. Um, So creating content or at least documenting the work that you are currently doing is going to open so many doors. I mean, Tim, here the two of us are. This is a great way of spending our our day. Um, We are creating some content, but the the important thing here is we are creating a network of like-minded people that's going to give opportunities. The two of us met because of your podcast. I started listening to the Teachers on Fire podcast because I think I saw it on Twitter or I was introduced to it by a friend. I can't exactly remember how I uh, got to know about your podcast, I started listening. And because of that, I followed you on the other social media platforms. And I realized the two of us look at education and at life in similar ways. And here we are a few months later, um, talking to each other on the internet. I'm in South Africa, you're in Canada. And just imagine what can come from a collaboration between the two of us. And then if you Uh, extrapolate that onto everybody else's network. Just imagine the difference we can make if we all collaborate like this. I keep coming back to the idea that sharing is caring, that it's actually, I think sometimes there's this idea out there among educators and and really some fabulous educators that to share on social media is sort of the egotistical move or the self-promoting move. And I I try to work toward this shift in mindset that says, actually, it's the caring move to share. And and like you said, it's all about documenting the learning journey and sharing those defeats as well as the victories, because other teachers draw inspiration from that. So uh, what I hear you saying is it may not be for every educator, the, the social media activity, but there is tremendous strength. There's tremendous opportunity and learning and insight that comes from connecting and engaging with a professional learning network beyond the walls of your building. Francois, as you look across your PLN, speaking of the PLN and your own professional practice today, what else is setting you on fire about education? 
Tim, when I started um, this consulting company of mine and I knew I wanted to work with teachers, I actually thought that I would spend most of my time working with, you know, novice teachers or working with principals maybe or like people just new to education. Uh, that was the, 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 the thought I had when I started the consulting company. But I was blown away by the amount of experienced teachers reaching out to me. I mean, I've got a big network of, um, what's it? Uh, teachers who are very close to retirement. I mean, there's two years left probably within their tenure. And they approach me and say, listen, I need you to assist me. I want to start using social media. I want to start uh, using technology when I teach. And I didn't expect this whatsoever. These experienced teachers can basically just coast the next two years and then take their pension and not worry about anything. But these experienced teachers are, are of the mindset, and I think that's the thing that that, that really um, um, ignites my fire, is that we've got these experienced teachers that are humble enough in knowing that I don't know the technology, but I can see the value. And I want to start using this um, to to make a difference because the other thing that the that the experienced teachers tell me is, you know what, my my pension is most likely not going to carry me through for my lifetime. They they realize that they're going to live for another thirty years most likely, um, and their pension is not going to cover their income or cover their expenses um, in, throughout their lifetime. So they want to start seeing how they can use the skills and the knowledge they already have to earn an income past uh, professional schooling or their full-time schooling. And that really just shows me what a super teacher really is. And, and it comes back to that mindset of continuous learning um, and not just giving up towards the end. I think every educator should be listening to that because we all know the jokes about teacher salaries, but really seriously, why not explore these other options, these other ways of streaming income that would not be, you know, that would be something that would be a win-win for both you and for students around the world. Why not take a look at that? And I think if, you, if you're reliant only on your salary from your school, I don't know what the situation is like um, um, in your country, but if you're only reliant on your salary, um, you're in for a very, very rough time. I'm uh, I, I'm not in the business of, of predicting, but what I can already start seeing what's happening is many of our private schools, especially, um, they're laying um, down teachers, they're firing teachers uh, or retrenching them at least because they're realizing that uh, because of COVID-19 and the economic fallout that's coming, um, that they won't be able to sustain the current number of um, teachers they have on their staff. So we need to start thinking of ways in which we can diversify our streams of income in which other way it can, it can possibly be. Um, so uh, my message to teachers would be don't only rely on your salary as a means to an income. We have to start diversifying. Francois, how are you looking to grow professionally and improve your practice right now? Can you share about a specific professional goal or maybe that next project that you're currently working on? So my um, next goal is focusing on this business of mine and keeping on motivating, inspiring and supporting teachers and finding new modalities to do that in. So um what started happening recently is I started uh, learning about uh, online events and how I can host professional development events for teachers, not just the typical, let's do a webinar and now for the next half an hour to an hour, we're trying to basically upsell you to a product that we're doing. That doesn't make sense to me. I'd much rather want to create an event where teachers feel like, you know what, we can collaborate together. We can start learning from each other. Um, so my my whole view or uh, the, uh, what I'm trying to upskill myself in is how to use online webinar platforms, but to create events and um, yeah, events or, or, or almost an atmosphere around learning for teachers. So that's what I'm currently busy with. If we can jump into the technical weeds for a moment, are you familiar with StreamYard? No, not at all. Okay, that seems to be a platform. I hope I'm getting that name right, but I, I see more and more education content creators moving into StreamYard. You mentioned webinars, and StreamYard allows you to synchronously broadcast across a lot of these different social media platforms at one time. So YouTube Live, Facebook Live, Instagram, and so forth, Periscope, and also take comments from all of these different platforms in one place and then highlight them on the screen. So that's something that I am curious about. I wondered if uh, you have dabbled in that. You probably use other 
platforms and applications right now, but that is an interesting space. That's one that personally resonates with me as well. I love to pull back the curtains on who you are as a person, Francois. So let's move outside of education and content and talk about another area of learning for you. What is it that ignites your passions when you leave the education context and brings you alive as a human being? So my uh, other passion lies within exercise and um, health. So um, just to give you an idea, um, I never realized how unhealthy I was uh, for the majority of my of my 20s. I'm now 35. Um, and basically from the age of like 24 to about 34-ish, 33-ish, I led a very unhealthy life. Um, so much so that um, I weighed 130 kilograms in uh, January of... Uh, of 2018 um, and uh, because of uh, many other personal things that happened including my divorce and the PhD that I had to do and complete in one year um, I decided I have to take control of my um, of my health um, so I'm a, a big CrossFit fan um, and I would I, I, and healthy lifestyle fan so I think that's a, a big part of my of my life also Share about a personal habit or a productivity hack that contributes to your success. I just get this vibe from you, Francois, that you are on it. You're on top of everything, all of these moving parts that compose your work. So is there an, a habit or a routine or an app that you rely on to get that all done? Oh, well, first of all, I'm glad it seems like I've got stuff together. It, it, it doesn't. It doesn't feel that way every single day. But and I think that's that's a, a big part of of uh, of of a success hack because I'm not I'm not calling myself successful, but I've got definite successful moments. Um, in that number one, I start my day and I make sure that I've got space in my day for exercise. The the not it doesn't just contribute to your physical health, but also your mental health. I mean, and that's that's when I listen to the teachers on fire podcast is when I'm out on the road for a jog. Um, so that's that's a big part of my day um, is exercising. Um, and then the second one, I think, is just to um, organize my day into into chunks. Um, I don't like working on the same thing for more like 45 minutes. Um, I want to I want to work on something for half an hour to 45 minutes and then take a solid break and do something else. I can't I'm not one of those people that can spend three, four hours working on the same thing. So for my personal uh, productivity, I, I break up activities into like 30 to 45 minute chunks. And that's how I get work done. That is so interesting. I was just listening to a podcast the other night from Brendan Burchard. He's the author of High Performance Habits. And he was saying from all of his research, the time is right around 50 minutes. So you're right in that same neighborhood of 50 minutes, 45 minutes of flow state or deep work. And then take that break, revitalize your mind and then get back to it. So yeah, that's that's a great strategy. It's not one that I have mastered yet, but I like the sound of it for sure. It's one that I need to aim for. Well, Francois, it is time for your quick picks, the education voices and resources that are shaping your practice and inspiring your thinking today. So let's start at Twitter. Tell us about someone we should follow there and share why they've been inspiring you lately. That's such a difficult one because Twitter, uh, even though everybody is thinking that Twitter is like the cesspool of the social media, I find that Twitter for teachers specifically, um, it's it's such a great place to, to get uh, information. So I'm not going to focus on one individual. I'm rather going to give a shout out to uh, the South African network of teachers on Twitter. We use the hashtag ZAEDU. So ZA is the uh, abbreviation we use on the net for South Africa. So every if you see a website that's .co.za, that means it's from South Africa. Um, the SA was taken by Saudi Arabia, so, we, uh, so we've got ZA. So ZAEDU, that's the hashtag we use. Um, we've got a chat every last Wednesday of uh, the month. Um, at eight o'clock at night, our time. I'm not sure what that would mean in terms for for Canada. It's probably what like eleven or ten your your time, um, but that's every every last Wednesday of the month we have a chat on hashtag ZAEDU. So follow us there. All right, Z or Z for our American friends. <laughs> <laughs> Point us to an ed tech tool that you currently really enjoy using somewhere in your professional practice. 
So uh, I'd much rather talk about my teachers and what they use, and they're very, very interested, and they love what the, the, the Google Suite for Education does. So that's really good. I mean, even in my own business, I use uh, G Suite for Business. So that would be the one. The other one um, is Crowdcast. Um, it's a webinar tool uh, with a lot of functionalities, and that's what I'm using for my online events. And I just love the, the collaborative community space that it creates. And I think there's scope to include that in schools for maybe like online assemblies um, and ideas around that. So I really like um, Crowdcast. See, I knew there had to be another big platform that you're comfortable with. So Crowdcast. Awesome. Francois, as we've talked about, you've been a great supporter of this podcast. What else are you listening to when you're out on those runs or deep in those CrossFit workouts? What else is at the top of your podcast deck? So uh, this wouldn't be complete if the two of us uh, talk about social media and content creation. If I don't shout out Gary Vaynerchuk's uh, podcast, Um, that man and the way in which he thinks about communication um, is absolutely amazing. I think teachers have got a lot to learn from what he says on his podcast. Um, So it's the Gary V audience, the audio experience, um, but you can just uh, uh, Google, I think, Gary Vaynerchuk or Gary V. I've been enjoying Gary on my runs lately, just the sort of the tenor of his speaking. And I will say, I mean, from my own perspective, not every episode is a win, right? But he does. I really like his keynotes and his Q&A. And uh, and you're right. He pushes us to get out there and share our ideas. Tell about a YouTube channel that you're subscribed to, one that really provides value either in the education space or the learning space or just the the pure amusement space. I'm going to give a shout out to uh, uh, an OG of uh, of YouTube, um, and that's Philip DeFranco. I don't know whether whether he's big in Canada. I understand he's he's, he's large in in America, um, but uh, Philip DeFranco um, he's got a news channel. Um, and daily daily episodes on news, but he brings a very balanced view. So he, he brings both sides of, of a story, um, fights against fake news, and then gives his own opinion. But I mean, he's the major reason why I like um, social media content, and specifically YouTube, because that's where I started. He had a, a, a show in the, in the beginning, the early days, um, called SourceFed. Um, and that was the first YouTube channel I ever subscribed to. And that's why I got the idea, like, how cool would a YouTube show for teachers be and then that was the the initial way in which I started my YouTube channel. I want to park there for just a moment, Francois. Where are you with the YouTube creation? I, th- I feel like things have slowed for you a little bit. Is that something you would like to get back to in a bigger way? So um, I, I started off with only focusing on YouTube. And I've realized now that that's a mistake. I think the reason why I wanted to do that is because um, you, can, you can monetize that. And that's a probable way for you to earn income. But I realized the more I did it that... Uh, especially in education, you're not going to blow up and have millions of views on an education video necessarily. Um, so I've, I've, I've changed my strategy totally to I'd much rather put my content all over social media, all over the internet, and give access to people where they um, would prefer the content. So a, a lot of my, my videos um, go onto Facebook, but I also post them on YouTube, and they also go onto the podcast. So wherever the audience feels more comfortable with consuming the content, I want to provide it to to them on those platforms. The last question, Francois, is just for fun. What are you watching on Netflix these days during the, especially during the quarantine? And if it's not Netflix, uh, that's fine if it's another streaming service, but what are you currently into? So um, I actually play a lot of Magic the Gathering, um, so I don't I don't really watch too much TV in in, in general um, or stream a lot of, of videos. So I, I play a lot of Magic the Gathering. So the uh, I either spend playing online or I consume content about that. So that that takes away a lot of time from from consuming uh, um, other content. But I do watch Rick and Morty, and I'm glad that the new uh, episodes are are coming out uh, in the in the next few weeks. Um, so I'm a major major fan of of Rick and Morty. What is Magic the Gathering? En- enlighten me. Okay, so um, it is. A, I think it started in the early 90s. It's a trading card game, pretty much the same as Pokemon. 
Um, but quite huge. I know in, in America, in uh, in the United States, it's 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 large. It's huge. Um, it's basically a combination between fantasy gaming and chess. Um, so uh, a lot of spin-offs came from it. Um, I think um, I don't know whether uh, you're familiar with the game Hearthstone, uh, but Pokemon is the other one. So it's a trading card game, but a strategy fantasy type uh, game. So fun. Francois, we mentioned all of the different social media platforms, and I think that is great advice, particularly for educators looking to share their ideas and resources. You've got to make yourself available wherever people live. And I I think it it doesn't work long term to just expect them to come to one space, although we are limited by time in many respects. What are the best ways for the listeners to follow you and where can they go? So if uh, your audience would like to consume my content, they can just Google uh, Super Teachers Unite and that'll probably bring up either Facebook, uh, YouTube or the podcast. And if they want to reach out to me, um, I'm very active and very responsive to, uh, to teachers. If they want to DM me on other platforms, uh, they can go for at super underscore teacher underscore F. So that's typically um, TikTok, uh, Instagram, Twitter, yeah, those three. Yes, I've now made three TikTok videos, friends. I'm really, I, I'm still such a TikTok newbie, but it is a fun place to hang out, especially on those days when you're feeling a little down. This has been so much fun. It's been a long time coming, Francois. So I want to thank you again for sharing your time with the podcast today. I'm so grateful for your support. I I applaud everything you are doing and offering teachers. And as I mentioned earlier, just that positive energy, that optimism that you bring to the profession. It's so uplifting. So thank you again. Take care and let's talk again soon. Thanks, Tim. It's absolutely amazing being part of your show and keep on doing the great work you are doing. Um, I see you're going to go places. Before we sign off today, I'd like to share some highlights from the Teachers on Fire Nation. First, on Instagram, I posted a quote from Dan Schobel that read, My prediction is that in the next 10 years, resumes will be less common and your online presence will become what your resume is today at all types and sizes of companies, end quote. And to that, John Sowash at JR Sowash replied, quote, 100%. This is already happening with coders. Nobody cares about what degree you have. They care about what you did, end quote. Thank you so much for that comment, John. And of course, make sure to give John a follow. Again, his handle is at JR Sowash. That's John Sowash of the Chromebook Classroom. Over on the Teachers on Fire group on Facebook, my colleague Megan Churchill Brown wrote, quote, had so much fun talking with you today. Thanks for supporting and encouraging me and other teachers, end quote. Of course, Megan was referring to a post I made about Instagram Live and our conversation there. So keep an eye out for me on Instagram and by all means do reach out if you too would like to be part of one of my 10 to 15 minute learning conversations there. And to Megan, thank you so much for joining me there in my little but growing group on Facebook. To all who have read, viewed, liked, retweeted, commented, or replied to my content on any of these platforms, thank you. You are the fuel to my fire, and I so appreciate your support. I want to leave you with this quote from my reading, Teachers on Fire. It's from a classic, Teach Like a Pirate. Increase student engagement, boost your creativity, and transform your life as an educator. And of course, Teach Like a Pirate is written by Dave Burgess at Burgess Dave on Twitter. And he writes, quote, We have unbelievably talented kids sitting in front of us, and many are starving for the opportunity to display their creativity. We should do everything we can to provide them the opportunity to hone their artistic skills and create, end quote. I love the sentiment there and the quote itself is so challenging. Am I really doing everything I can to give each of my students opportunities to express that creativity? That's something I always want to push myself on and I'm sure you feel the same. Again, I'm your host, Tim Cavey, and I'm so grateful that you decided to spend some of your day listening to this podcast. I hope that in some way the content you heard from Dr. Francois Nodia ignited your thinking and inspired your practice, and I'll meet you next week right here on the Teachers on Fire podcast. Take care and stay safe.